Welcome everyone. You've joined the Utilizing American Rescue Plan funding to accelerate early learning webinar. I'm Allison Mullendorf with the Alabama School Readiness Alliance. And I'd like to thank the Alabama League of Municipalities and the Council for Leaders in Alabama Schools for partnering with us on today's webinar. The American Rescue Plan of 2021 will bring an unprecedented amount of funding to the state of Alabama. It provides 779 million for Alabama cities, 951 million split across Alabama counties, and more than $2 billion for our public education system. And 90% of that is actually going out directly to local education agencies. The plan also includes a historic $40 billion investment nationally to support America's childcare industry, which has been struggling to serve children and families and keep their doors open during COVID. And everyone who is working in early childhood and teaching um, in our public schools during this time, I just wanna thank you um, for everything that you've done and sacrificed this year. I know it hasn't been easy. Young children had some of the biggest disruptions in their learning and care throughout the pandemic. We know that from national surveys. We know that from data right here in Alabama. And I've experienced that myself with my almost three-year-old daughter. Um, her uh, child care center was closed for many months and we've had to make do and figure things out just like so many families across the nation and across the, the world really. Um, here at the Alabama School Readiness Alliance, we are focused on expanding access to high quality pre-K. Um, we have a plan to ensure that all Alabama four-year-olds will have access to high quality pre-K by 2025, if not sooner. And we thank the Alabama legislature and Governor Ivey for everything they've done to um, expand access year over year by increasing funding for the program. Uh, even over the last, just the last decade, funding for the program has increased by more than $100 million, but we still have a long way to go. Um, we estimate that it will take um, around $250 million to fully fund first class pre-K, um, but that's just a drop in the bucket when you look at our state's education budget, which is more than $7 billion. Um, but local leaders need not wait until the state fully funds pre-K to help all children in your communities gain access. Students that have attended Alabama's high quality first class pre-K program, regardless of income, zip code, or demographics, are doing better than their peers in reading and math. And that's from a study that has followed them all the way through middle school. We thank you for your interest in expanding access to this critical program. And I know that working together and utilizing some of these flexible dollars from the American Rescue Plan, along with state investments that will sustain the program in the future, that we can make tremendous progress. Now I'd like to introduce um, Secretary Cooper. Secretary Barbara Cooper um, is entering her second year as Secretary of the Alabama Department of Early Childhood Education. And her program has been recognized by the National Institute for Early Education Research as one of the top programs in the country, actually number one for its quality. A couple other states have joined us now in having number one quality, but um, thank you for everything you do, Secretary, and congratulations on the $24 million increase that the state legislature approved for first class pre-K, as, as well as the other increases for your department in the education budget this week. Um, I wanted to just ask Secretary Cooper today to come on and welcome everyone and share the incredible resource and leadership of her department and, and how she can partner with you and your communities to help more children gain access to pre-K and other critical early learning supports. Secretary. 
Thank you, Allison, for the introduction. This is a very exciting day. We really appreciate the support that ASRA and the Alabama League of Municipalities gives to our department as we work across the entire state to increase access to first-class pre-K. To our local leaders and stakeholders in the audience today, thank you for taking time to learn strategies to strengthen your community's early learning investments in early childhood education and care. Having spent over 25 years in K-12, I know firsthand the benefits of a high quality early learning experience. And I'm here today to stress the positive impact a robust early childhood education commitment can have in each one of your local communities. Please know the work we do in the first 1100 days of a child's life counts. Our K-12 system is not designed to effectively close gaps that occur in the earliest years. In fact, even our most successful school systems fail to close achievement gaps by more than a year when children enter already behind. We can support K-12 best by mitigating gaps in the early learning years. One of the most crucial lessons we have learned over the past year is just how important childcare is to our workforce. Parents can't work if they're unable to secure childcare. Moreover, studies show that parents who are more productive when they have their child in a quality childcare and they have fewer absences from work. Childcare is an obvious workforce development issue for all community leaders. Now, what may not be as obvious is the fact that today's young children are also your future workforce. Don't we all want our community to benefit from a talented, highly skilled workforce that is ready for 21st century careers? Investments in education that are made before kindergarten pay huge dividends. 95% of a child's brain is developed through age five. Therefore, we want to ensure positive early learning and care. The brain is so adaptable and neural connections can be influenced by positive nurturing and stimulating early experiences. Now, by the same token, we also impact the brain through negative experiences that leave our children vulnerable through adverse childhood experiences. Alabama has committed, as Allison stated, to investing in our youngest learners through the first class pre-K program. This was only made possible by continuous gubernatorial and bipartisan legislative commitment to invest in early childhood education. Children who attend first class pre-K are more likely to be proficient in reading and math, less likely to be chronically absent, need special education, or receive disciplinary referrals. There has been no stronger supporter of early childhood education than our Governor Kay Ivey. The fiscal year 22 budget that was proposed by Governor Ivey and was passed by the legislature yesterday provides more than $24 million for increased pre-K funding. This increase will give access to pre-K classrooms to 44% of four-year-old children. Our goal is to reach 70% of four-year-old children by 2025. 75, 70% access is what we believe will give everyone who wants pre-K for their child an opportunity. Please know that our department, as well as all of the various supporting organizations are ready and willing to support with local communities as you make plans for expanding early childhood education in your area. This week, the department held our second of three meetings with Alabama mayors regarding investing early. It has been a great collaboration with the Hunt Institute and the Alabama League of Municipalities as we seek to enlighten and engage mayors and city officials about the benefits created by investing early. Let me close by sharing. This calling to serve Alabama's children and families is very personal for me. I attended Head Start in the 70s and have benefited greatly from high quality early experiences. 
My grandbaby turned one month old this week. I want the same great opportunities for every Alabama infant, child, infant and child that I desire for my own family. Let's work together to maximize these one-time funds to make Alabama number one in quality, not only in first class pre-K, but across early education and care, birth all the way through age eight. Let's do this today and in the future for our youngest citizens. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you so much, Secretary. Now, You're very welcome. yeah, I'm, I'm so grateful for your leadership and everything that you're doing. Um, now I'm pleased to be able to show my screen here and introduce for the very first time our brand new toolkit that is available to all of you as you plan for pre-K expansion. And I, I want to just clarify that this toolkit is really focused on how you can use state, federal, local, American Rescue Plan funding um, that's going to the counties and going to school systems to help your county, your city, your region get to pre-K for all, which is what we estimate is 70% of four-year-olds. And we estimate that because that is the traditional take-up rate of a program um, in uh, like in other states that have universal pre-K. It's basically because it's a voluntary program, uh, we estimate that about 70% of families in our state will participate when it's made available to everyone. And, and if more want to join and they're still waiting lists, we'll keep advocating for more um, expansion. I know that maybe one or two states are getting closer to 80% with their all uh, with their pre-K for all programs. And, and we're keeping a close eye on that. Um, but you do not need to wait for the state to fully fund the program in order to start serving more children in your community. The American Rescue Plan offers incredible flexible dollars that we're going to talk about today and that our uh, national experts are going to shed a little bit more light on. Um, I also want to say that the Alabama School Readiness Alliance is working very hard at the state level um, with our partners and to advocate um, that DHR, which um, manages Alabama's federal child care money, that DHR um, continues to use their federal funding to improve and expand access to child care. So this particular toolkit in this call is not going to be about the new federal child care dollars that were appropriated in the American Rescue Plan. Although if you want to work with us on making sure that those are um, that those get to the childcare centers and the children and families that need it, uh, we would love for you to join us in that advocacy effort. Um, but our new toolkit is gonna help you use some of these other more flexible sources of funding to help expand pre-K in your community. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. And you know, this is not a professionally run webinar, so you might see some stuff as I'm pulling up the web, the, website. Okay, we're a nonprofit. We're a little scrappy. But um, the Alabama School Readiness Alliance, um, our new toolkit is a roadmap, like I said, for fully funding Alabama's first class pre-K in your community. How do you use this roadmap? Well, we have county profiles for every county that is currently serving fewer than 70% of their four-year-olds in the Alabama first class pre-K program. And we really wanted to break it down by city and we might be able to do that for some of, some of the larger cities, but the way that it's typically tracked in our state is at the county level. But please contact us and work with us. Um, we'll show you where to find our contact information if you wanna to try to drill it down by city. Um, Just to pull up an example, and I'm gonna pull up Montgomery County because I've been doing some work. I live in Montgomery. My daughter's going to attend school in Montgomery um, in a few years. And I've been working with the mayor in Montgomery on some local plans to expand access to quality pre-K. So I'll use Montgomery as my example. And wouldn't it be funny if it didn't pull up? Okay, so 
this is how a roadmap works. Um, and this is, how, we hope that you will use these. We hope that these county profiles can help you start a conversation you, that you can call together a Zoom meeting or a socially distanced meeting in your community with leaders and show them the roadmap for your community. Show them where you are, where you can go in terms of expanding pre-K and, and how much it would cost. And uh, this is Montgomery County's roadmap. Um, there are currently 67 Alabama first class pre-K classrooms for four-year-olds in Montgomery County serving 1,206 students. And Montgomery County is a little bit over the statewide average of 37% of four-year-olds. Uh, they're serving 40% of four-year-olds in our county. And we, I, I believe that Montgomery will probably need to go beyond 70% um, of four-year-olds just because we have so much need here and so many um, students um, uh, from low-income backgrounds who historically you know, perform uh, more poorly in school, and we need to close those academic achievement gaps. So this is an estimate of how we could get to 70% of four-year-olds, but like I said, in a county like Montgomery, I'd, I'd, I'd like to see us shoot for even higher, but we've estimated for everyone here how to get um, the number of classrooms that you need in order to uh, serve 70% of students. So before I get into that, I also want to show you that this pie chart is showing the diverse delivery of Alabama's first class pre-K program and how that breaks down in each county. So for Montgomery County, they have 12 uh, pre-Ks that are operated by community organizations. I know the YMCA has a big presence here um, in Montgomery. We also um, in Montgomery County have one uh, child care uh, delivering the program one faith-based, which is probably also a child care, 19 Head Start class, classrooms deliver first class pre-K, 31 public school uh, first class pre-K classroom, and three operated by universities, um, which is awesome. <clears throat> so it's really important as you're looking at expanding access to this program that you think about all the different providers and that you build your pre-K system on top of the existing early childhood uh, system. We want our private childcare programs and our church-based childcare pr programs to apply for Alabama first class pre-K grants and deliver this nationally recognized program in, in their own centers. Um, so it's really important that you take a look at where classrooms are currently located and, and really where the gaps are. So here in Montgomery, we're actually working really hard with the mayor and other stakeholders to educate childcare providers about the importance, um, or sorry, not the important, well, they, they are doing the work so they know it's important, but just educating, letting them know that they can even apply for the grants, helping them with their grant applications. And I had some great conversations with providers who just submitted their first class pre-K grants this week. Um, so lastly, I wanna talk about the funding. So we're showing you in every county what it would take to fully fund this program to reach 70% of four-year-olds. In Montgomery, that would take just over $6 million. And of course that can come from the additional state investments in pre-K and they have grown every year over the last decade. So once, once you get first class pre-K grants in your community, they don't go away. They're not temporary. The programs reapply for the grants every three years. And as far as I know, programs have, you know, they've never had to reduce the number of classrooms that, that they've had in first class pre-K um, in Secretary Cooper's agency, which runs the program. They have never, um, so that's a really important message. I think a lot of programs think grant and they think, oh, well, this is temporary. How am I gonna sustain this? Well, state funding has been a very sustainable source for first class pre-K. And I'm providing a lot of information as I go over this toolkit. So please do pop your questions in the chat or in the Q&A and we'll get to them either during the presentation or during the Q&A. So I talked about the additional funding that Montgomery needs. I talked about the state as a very great sustainable source of funding and it's the primary source of funding for Alabama's first class brigade program. 
And it does require a 25% match um, coming from the local level. And a lot of programs actually, they meet their match with kind of in-kind contributions, the building, things like that. So anyways, the local first class pre-K monitor and regional director can help programs, you know, figure out how much matching funds they need or if they need any at all. And they're also able to charge um, a small amount of um, tuition based on the sliding scale. Um, so that's something that's important to remember if you're trying to meet your matching funds or increase your matching funds or increase the budget for your classroom. So I talked about the state source of funding. Um, we have many cities and counties investing also, and lots of school systems investing in first class pre-K using their Title I dollars. So, you know, this can also come from those sources of funding, and that's why we're citing the American Rescue Plan as such a moonshot moment for early childhood in our state, not just because of the large influx of funding for child care that we know is going to go out directly and reach those child care providers. Um, it really is something that we can use to start up new pre-K classrooms and then have a plan to eventually start applying for state funding to sustain those pre-K classrooms. Um, and again, if you have any questions about this, I'd be happy to answer it during the presentation um, or during the Q&A. The last funding figure that you see here, and I hope you can see my cursor, is that Montgomery would also need about 1.3 million in one-time startup costs. For every classroom that gets started up, they need to have a classroom kit. And it, that basically has all of the high quality learning tools and environmental things that you need in your pre-K classroom. Um, the Department of Early Childhood does include that in one of the types of grants that they give to pre-K providers, but there's nothing that is stopping local communities from going ahead and purchasing those startup classroom toolkits um, with local or American Rescue Plan funding. I mean, American Rescue Plan is a one-time stimulus fund. So what better than to spruce up our early childhood classrooms or help childcare programs make building improvements um, with this one-time funding and then have that funding be sustained with state pre-K grants in the future. We're also encouraging um, local, local leaders to go ahead and um, not just help with the classroom startup kits and the playgrounds, you know, that are those one-time investments, but go ahead and do and expand for an additional 10 classrooms. Um, and those could be sustained for two years in your community with American Rescue Plan funding. And then you can write for state pre-K grants to sustain them. And again, state pre-K funding has been growing every year, but four-year-olds are only four once. So every year that we don't ensure that all four-year-olds have this program, children are falling through the cracks. So if American Rescue Plan can help us get more children in the program over the next couple of years, especially since children have experienced so much learning loss, our youngest children have had tremendous disruptions in their learning and, and lots of stress and trauma. In their, in their families during the pandemic. And we need more of them to have access to this program. Um, and that will help our K-12 system all the way through as the evidence shows. The very last thing on the toolkit is contact information for myself at, and the Alabama School Readiness Alliance, which is the advocacy group. And then on the right is contact information for the state agency, which administers first class pre-K and my colleague, Sam Adams over there in the agency will be willing to answer any of your questions just as I will. And we work together quite frequently. So I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my screen. And I wanna thank my partner, um, Kayla Bass with the Alabama League of Municipalities for being part of today's webinar. Um, it's just been great to have this opportunity to partner with your organization and thank you for your willingness. And we've worked together for a long time because she used to be at uh, our partner organization, Voices for Alabama's Children. So we know that she's got a heart for children and I'm so glad that she's at the league. Kayla is going to talk a little bit more about the funding that's coming in to local municipalities um, with the American Rescue Plan. Thanks, Kayla. Thanks, Allison. Do you want me to go ahead and introduce Anna or do you want me to start? 
Um, you can start with anything in your remarks that you have and then introduce Anna. All righty. Um, so for those not familiar with the league, uh, we're a nonpartisan membership association that represents nearly 460 incorporated cities and towns. And um, since 1935, we've worked to strengthen municipal government through advocacy training and legal guidance. And so for my remarks, I really wanted to focus on um, the guidance we have at this point. So you all have the most up-to-date guidelines as you begin deciding how to utilize your funds. And for some of our officials on the line, um, education will certainly be one of those. So of the 779 million being dispersed to municipalities and 951 to counties, we know that um, the act gives the US Department of Treasury 60 days from enactment to make their allocations to state and local governments. And we do expect this to take close to 60 days to develop that guidance. Um, cities over 50,000 in population will receive a direct check from the United States Department of Treasury and will receive their money within 60 days of the laws being enacted. Those under 50,000 in population will receive it from the Alabama Department of Finance and they'll receive their money uh, approximately 90 days from when the law was enacted. Um, funding will be released in two tranches, half of it being released um, by May 10th, 2021, and then the second half will be released under the second tranche one year after the disbursement of the first one. What we know now is that the funds can be used to make investments in water, sewer, and broadband infrastructure, but we don't have any additional guidance um, along those lines at this time. We know that state and local governments cannot use the funds toward pensions or to offset revenue resulting from a tax cut. Um, but if you need an estimate on what your city or town will receive, you can visit the league's website. It's almonline.org. You'll see a banner that says um, American Rescue Plan Act and you can click that. Um, and that will take you to your estimate as well as several other links that'll be helpful. Um, what you can begin doing now as a city, town, county, um, cities greater than 50,000 should ensure that they have a valid DUNS number, an active SAM registration, and payment information. Those cities and towns less than 50,000 in population must have a valid DUNS number to meet reporting requirements. Um, since you all will be receiving your money through the state government, you don't need an active SAM registration. And if you don't have either of those or don't know how to locate them, please get with me following the presentation today and I can certainly get you those links. Um, be prepared to report how you spend your funds to um, how, you, how you report those funds out. I know NLC is waiting on guidance from Treasury to know what details need to be included and in what format they'll need to be reported. Um, in the meantime, the league is encouraging our municipal officials to be getting together with leaders in their community to start developing strategic plans on how you all would like these funds to be spent. Um, determining what your needs are, who the partners are state and federally that can help you leverage these funds. And like I said, for some of you on the call, that's going to be investing in early childhood education. So begin those conversations now with people on the line, people in your community. So you all, before you get these funds have an idea of you know how to leverage these funds how to spend these funds and you know you start getting ideas of how these can be used um, but I'll close by saying we're continuing to work with NLC and Anna from NLC is on the call today but we're continuing to work with them the Alabama Department of Finance to gather as much guidance as we can um, so we can share that information with our officials and like I said we have a page on our website everything I just mentioned is on that page on our website but certainly if you have any trouble please reach out to me and we're happy to help in any way we can. And that concludes my remarks. Um, Allison, do you want me to go ahead and introduce Anna? Oh, sorry about that. I was That's okay. Yes, please do. And I'll pull up her video. Okay, at this time, I'm going to introduce Anna White. She's the program manager um, with Early Childhood Success through the National League of Cities. And Anna's going to be discussing with you all opportunities and examples from other cities. And she may hit on some of the other stuff I mentioned. Um, but if I left anything out, Anna, please feel free to mention it. We, I know, have worked closely with y'all, as have many other states. Um, and we, we appreciate y'all's partnership and guidance during this time. 
Thank you so much, Kayla, and thank you, Allison. And I appreciate the, uh, the Alabama School Readiness Alliance, the Alabama League of Municipalities, and the Council for Leaders in Alabama Schools for this opportunity. Um, and I also want to thank all the local elected leaders on the line for your service. This has been a trying year for so many communities, and we're encouraged by how many municipal leaders have stepped up to the plate to prioritize the needs of families with young children. You know, I think Kayla gave a great overview about what we know so far with the $65 billion in direct funding. Um, you know, NLC was uh, essential in this campaign to get more funding directly to local communities. We know in the first round under the CARES Act, the coronavirus relief funds didn't make it to all communities. Um, and so we're really excited that this direct funding will go to all cities, towns, and villages. One thing that I would put out for the cities that are under 50,000, you know, there is ironclad legislation. Um, leak out text in the legislation requiring states to make sure that communities get their funding. Um, so don't worry about that. Um, I was asked to talk about whether early childhood is, is an eligible expenditure. Um, while we're still awaiting guidance from the Treasury Department, uh, the short answer is yes. Um, however, precisely what that means, um, we're still awaiting. So we do know that it will be no more restrictive than the CARES Act coronavirus relief funds. So the things that cities were able to use the first round of funding for, they should be able to use for the second round of funding. Um, and so some of the things that um, I think uh, Kayla mentioned too. So if you don't know how much funding uh, you're gonna be receiving, you can of course go to the Alabama League of Municipalities. We also have the full spread to you here across the United States about um, what a community should be receiving. Um, so back to kind of what cities use the CARES Act funding for, for early childhood. So on the map, you can see the blue states are all those that received, uh, had cities that received direct funding under the CARES Act. Um, the yellow states had cities that used some of that funding to support early childhood. Um, so for example, um, the city of Fresno used funding for childcare vouchers. Um, that was, again, part of what San Diego's approach was. They used about $5 million for childcare vouchers. Um, what's interesting about San Diego is they were able to create a partnership with their county. So the city put in five million and the county uh, matched that with another five million. Um, Albuquerque in New Mexico used about 2.5 million of their funding to support um, a community impact fund, which gave funding to families that they could then use for child care. Um, Texas, Austin was a little bit of an outliner. Outliner. Um, they were one of the cities that uh, provided a fund directly to child care. Um, so they provided a child care support fund, which allowed a lot of flexibility um, for child care uh, providers to determine what their local needs were. Um, in this first round of funding, we saw a lot of cities really prioritize immediate needs, so immediately stabilizing the industry. I think within the next round of funding, um, especially since it's going to be coming out um, in two, two separate tranches, um, you know, we're encouraging city leaders to really think um, long term about this funding and how it can be used to, as part of a broader uh, recovery effort. So think not just about sort of immediate needs, but some of what are the long term needs for um, stabilizing the industry moving forward. Um, already, cities are starting to think about how they might use their ARP funding. Um, like I said, we still are awaiting Treasury guidance, so please take all of this with a little bit of a grain of salt. Um, the city of Seattle just passed its municipal resolution um, back at the end of March, outlining how they're thinking about some of their funding priorities um, and kind of some of the programs that they'd like to support. Um, they have an entire section on child care, so some of the things that they're looking at um, are direct financial assistance. Um, thinking about things to support the construction of new child care centers or capital improvements. Um, really thinking about professional development, so investing in things like mentoring and coaching programs, really helping providers obtain licensing. Um, so really thinking long term about really how can you grow the supply of child care in the community, I think is a, um, one of the trends that we're seeing. Um, and also too, just in terms of professional development. So, you know, really looking at how do you um, expand that career ladder. So, you know, happy to see that Seattle is really thinking both immediately in terms of stabilization, but also long term and uh, in terms of supporting the industry. Um, another thing too, cities are thinking about EC more uh, broadly. So even though some cities haven't put together formalized ordinances outlining their funding priorities, they are working to bring stakeholders together to really outline their vision for recovery. Um, so one example I'll highlight here is Columbus, Ohio. Um, 
this is kind of what their recommended actions you can see on the page, but sort of broad strokes, they're really focusing on workforce development. So looking at things like pay parity, substitute pools, bonuses and benefits and paid leave. I think if anything, COVID has really shed light on sort of the essential nature of childcare workers and how undervalued they are. Um, and so I think this is a real opportunity for Columbus to really um, elevate the workforce. I think they're doing that um, not only through a focus on the workforce um, in terms of compensation, but also so kind of that broader <laughs> messaging and public recognition. Um, another thing too that we saw as a result of COVID were states really stepping up to the plate to think about how they can revision their subsidy program to make it more um, you know, conducive to uh, child care providers as well as families. So one of the things that Columbus is really focusing on too is how they can um, continue the state of Ohio to pay based on enrollment rather than attendance um, and really thinking intentionally about paying based on the cost of care. Um, and those are some things that we're hoping that more states will think about um, moving forward. Um, so here are NLC's principles for coronavirus local fiscal recovery fund. You know, one of the things that we, we say is use the dedicated grants and programs first whenever possible. And so save your funding for some of those flexible opportunities. Um, really get together with your um, stakeholders and staff to really create a comprehensive needs assessment. Um, you know, save pet projects for earmarks, prioritize fiscal stability and getting um, families and residents back to work. Um, another thing, too, was really maintain good records and document success. Um, you know, this is a, a, a really watershed moment, I think, in terms of the amount of money that's going directly to local communities. At the National League of Cities, we want to see this continue. So I think it's on, it behooves all of us to really think about how we elevate the impact that this money is making in communities. And again, you know, invite your congressional delegation to be part of your success, continue to elevate and share how this money is helping your residents. Um, we also, I wanna make sure to highlight to think about this ARP and future EC funding really holistically. So the direct money that's going toward cities is not the only money going um, toward early childhood, the early childhood system um, in your state and community. So there's the Child Care Stabilization Fund, um, that's about 24 billion. Um, that's going to support child care providers and help them remain afloat during the pandemic. Um, there's also an increase in CCDPG of about 15 billion. Um, McV, so the Maternal Infant and Early Childhood Home Visiting Program is also getting 150 million. Head Start is getting another 1 billion. Um, so this is all within ARP, but we also know that there is a budget going through Congress as well that includes some additional funding uh, for CCDBG Head Start as well. Um, and then we also know there's two other big uh, proposals out there in Congress, the American Jobs Plan, um, which includes a, a bunch of funding for early childhood facilities infrastructure. Um, and then uh, the White House, uh, President Biden just announced this week, the American Families Plan, which includes quite a bit of funding for universal preschool expansion and childcare expansion. Um, so really use this opportunity to bring partners together, think holistically about sort of where all the funding is in your community and what's next to what's likely to happen next in terms of potential funding sources as well. So don't just think about this individual pot of funding, but look at the broader ecosystem and use the funding to fill gaps is what we would encourage city leaders to really think about. Um, if you wanna learn more, um, we have a website here. Um, a couple things that I will flag. One is the COVID-19 local action tracker. Um, since the start of the pandemic, NLC has been tracking local actions. So how cities have used their CARES Act dollars, how cities are thinking about using their ARP funds. Um, you can sort by category. Another thing on here is the summary of provisions. So really thinking about sort of that the broader buckets of funding that's coming in through ARP, not just the 65 billion in funding directly to municipalities. So if you wanna see um, what's in there. Um, three, there's an allocations and guidance. So like I mentioned, you can see your local estimated allocations, but that's also where um, it contains some, any new guidance that we're hearing from the treasury department. NLC is in constant communication with the treasury department in the White House. Um, and so, one of the things that we'd like to flag too is we have um, an implementation questions form. So if there's anything that you guys are thinking about, questions that you have, things that you'd like to do, we'd love to hear that. Um, please use this form and we'll be sure to elevate that within our contacts um, at the Treasury Department um, and the White House. 
So that's kind of an overview. This is who we are, our contact information. Feel free to reach out. Um, like I said, the National League of Cities, we represent more than 20,000 cities, towns, and villages, not only on advocacy, but on implementation issues. Um, the early childhood team, we work directly with city leaders to help them think strategically about how to build a stronger early childhood system. So happy to answer any questions and um, I'll take a look at the, the chat box, but um, it's been a pleasure. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing all the great work that you all are doing to support young kids and families. Thank you so much, Anna. That was some great information. I learned a ton. And at this time, I'm going to invite our partner, uh, Dr. Vic Wilson with Council for Leaders in Alabama Schools. And he is going to say hello to everyone and introduce our next expert. Thank you, Allison. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to be on here. Class is uh, very supportive of early learning. Uh, Pre-K through three leadership academy has uh, led the nation and is something that has been replicated and is being replicated across the nation. So it gives me great pleasure to be here. Um, and I'm also able to introduce to you Danielle Ewan, principal. Danielle served in numerous leadership positions in child care and early education policy. She served as the director of early childhood education in the District of Columbia Public Schools. She oversaw the operations there. She has also served as Director of Child Care and Early Education at the Center for Law and Social Policy. Uh, she has also worked at Children's Defense Fund as a Senior Program Associate in the Child Care and Development Division and was Assistant Director for the National Child Care Information. Without further ado, join me in welcoming Danielle Ewan. Thank you so much, Vic. I'm really happy to be here and uh, see some old friends in the participant list. Um, I see some new friends and I'm really happy to give you a very quick overview of all the ways that um, your school districts, your school money can be used to augment some of the ideas that have been talked about before. So um, I'm gonna share my screen in, in a minute and give you one slide, but I wanted to start by saying a couple of things. When we think about the systems of care that we wanna create, when we think about the co continuum we wanna build for children from birth, through the age of school entry and beyond, as we heard from Secretary Cooper and others, we wanna make sure we're thinking about all the different places where there's funds. And you just heard about all the money that's coming to your local communities. Um, uh, we heard about some of the childcare money that's in, in there as well. But one of the other big pieces is the money that is available through the three different pandemic relief packages for education. Um, and in each of the packages, there was new money. So, uh, and it has different names. So the K-12 money is known as ESSER, which is the Elementary and Secondary Schools Emergency Relief Funds. The governors also got a Governor's Emergency Education Relief Fund in the first two packages. And just to give you a sense of the size of those funds that are available, through those three packages, um, K-12 in your state is getting about $3.1 billion to spend over a couple of years. And the governor's money, which was in the first two packages, totaled to about 115 um, billion dollars. So really thinking about, that may not be right, 115 million. Um, so really thinking about all the places where the education system can help to fund these pieces that we've been talking about in early childhood. And so I'm going to share my screen and put something on the um, up that just talks about how education dollars can be used to, um, to support the system of care that we want for kids and families. Um, often when we think about education funds, we're thinking about K-12 and thinking about all the things that happen in a, in a public school. But really these funds can be used for children from birth through the age of school entry. And they can be used for a variety of services and supports. And I've put some of them up on the screen. It's really important to know that the ESSER funds and the governor's funds are very, very flexible, that they can be used for all of these supports and services, and that they can be used inside schools and also outside schools in child care centers, Head Starts, and even with family child care providers. And the dollars can be used to do all the things that we've heard about today. They can be used to create programs and provide classroom-based instruction for young children, threes and fours, fours and pre-K. They can pay for salaries and benefits. It's so important in our field that when we're building the pre-K system, we make sure that our childcare providers have salary parity when they're providing those services. And these dollars in ESSER and in the governor's fund, as well as in your traditional K-12 money from the feds can be used to pay all of these things. 
They can pay for home visiting programs. So when we're thinking about the needs of children and families in early childhood, and we think about the wraparound services and supports that they need, home visiting is one of those. You can see others on the slide that are incredibly important and provide linkages between and across the systems. Um, using these funds to think, to be thoughtful about transition between early childhood and K-12 and really investing time in those transitions, investing capacity and staff in those transitions so that um, school staff are working with Head Start and with child care centers and family child care to understand the needs of the children and the families coming, to orient those kids, to think about the data of those kids, to understand the cohort that's coming in. Is it a cohort that has a higher percentage of asthma? Is it a cohort that, um, it, as in the pandemic, hasn't had any formal um, experiences in a very long time? Is it a cohort that hasn't been exposed to books or other pre-literacy skills? And how do we think differently about that? So investing in transition with these dollars to really make sure that pre-K and K are really closely aligned. Investing in professional development for the same reason. And I wanna emphasize that these dollars can provide support for comprehensive support services, starting with developmental screenings for all children in the district, for instance, to really, again, understand the needs, the physical, the social, emotional, the mental health needs of our kids coming in, which particularly after 15 months of a pandemic will be incredibly important in the summer and in the new year. The funds can also support things like nutrition, vision, and dental and counseling services, as well as mental health services. So again, thinking through the full range of needs to make sure that when children are in those new pre-K programs, when they're in those classrooms, they can benefit from what's available to them in those classrooms, that we're not just meeting their academic needs, but they're meeting, we're meeting the need of the whole child. Importantly, in this particular year, funds can be used for summer programs, um, the ESSER funds uh, in the most recent version of the ARP, the American Rescue Plan, have specific set-asides for summer programs, and those dollars can be used at community-based programs. So as, and it's already the end of April, so thinking about how your community is going to address summer and making sure that those youngest children are included in those summer plans and that we're thinking about how to use these funds to make sure that they have an experience that will augment what is happening in the fall. So I wanted, mostly what I wanted to say is how important it is to know that these funds are part of the early childhood system, that these are not several different pieces that are siloed. It is a cliche to say that our children do not grow up in silos. It is a cliche to say that children are not born at four, but really thinking about how these systems of funding can be put together and leveraged to create a system of care for all children regardless of where they are, to meet the needs of their families and make sure that we're taking care of the whole child, that we're addressing their physical, their mental, their social, emotional needs, that we're bringing health care and uh, child care and schools together to really support kids and that we have the funding to do that right now with these literally billions of new dollars that are coming into our education system, making sure that our youngest kids are seen as part of that system, that principals, that school district leaders, that teachers, that everyone understands that those kids are their kids and not other. They're not outside the school system, they're part of it, and that those funds can be used to make sure those children have what they need. So I'll stop there, Allison, and see if there's any questions or how I can be part of the conversation. Awesome, thanks so much. You're rolling us perfectly into the Q&A section and I do see that some are starting to come in. I'm going to go ahead and ask all of our panelists to come back um, and turn their videos on so uh, and unmute themselves so that they can answer your questions. Thanks for that incredible information, Danielle. And thank you, Anna, uh, Kayla and Vic and Secretary Cooper. Um, and I just want to say something as we're um, gathering your questions, and, and that is that though the Alabama School Readiness Alliance's new roadmap and our work tends to focus on pre-K, and it's definitely, you know, the most growing part of our early childhood system in Alabama, and we're very, very proud that our state ranks number one in the nation for, for the quality of the Alabama first class pre-K program. However, I can't agree more with Danielle that we need to think in terms of how to support the entire birth to five system and actually birth to eight early learning system because children are considered to be young children and they learn like young children until grade three. And we really wanna see, you know, not just quality programs for 
our infants, toddlers, and preschoolers, but I would love to see our kindergarten through third grade classrooms look a little bit more like pre-K classrooms in being play-based, project-based, um, getting down on the floor with children, um, not standing, not that teacher standing at the desk. Um, so, you know, I think pre-K and early childhood really has a lot to offer, not just in terms of its direct impact, but um, on what it can teach to um, the, the rest of the system and the rest of the educators. Um, and that Secretary Cooper and her team do a phenomenal job. Um, and I know that she can work with you to create a comprehensive system in your community. And she's got some additional funding streams that we haven't even talked about on this call that, that we can all uh, work with you on, um, you know, if, if you follow up with us. So the first question is, are these funds available to assist private daycare childcare providers, uh, perhaps through vouchers to workers who use private early childcare? Um, these providers keep younger children and that enables people to go back to work. And I'm going to go ahead and start the answer to that question because I know the Alabama answer to that. And I'm going to let Danielle or anyone else elaborate. Yes, um, you can use these funds for those purposes, but there's also $700 million coming to the state of Alabama through the Child Care Development Block Grant through the American Rescue Plan. So there was dedicated funding for child care to do exactly what you're asking. Um, and actually the Alabama Department of Human Resources is utilizing quite a bit of that money and, and the money from the previous uh, COVID relief packages to do exactly what you're asking about, uh, Rick, which is um, actually opening up child care subsidies, which is basically vouchers for parents to, to get child care. Um, to essential workers. So they actually cover a lot of essential workers, all different types and categories of essential workers, not just healthcare workers. And you can go to dhr.alabama.gov um, and I'll pop that in the chat to learn about that, um, about that uh, subsidy program. Um, I know that Joan Wright, who's on our webinar, might be able to put something in the chat. I mean, in her area, I know a lot of um, a lot of essential workers are taking advantage of those subsidies. Um, Danielle or Anna or anyone else, would you like to add to that? Um, the only, thank you, Allison. That was a great and comprehensive answer. All I will say is that um, it's really important to know that in the guidance or in the federal legislative language for all of the programs that we've talked about within the relief packages, early childhood was mentioned as an allowable use. And I think that is um, a real signal about how the feds, both Congress and the Department of Education and HHS have seen the integration of these systems. So yes, childcare is included as an allowable use and allowable recipient of funds through all of these different pieces. I will say that an allowable use is not the same as a mandated use. And so you will have to do advocacy with those in your community who manage these funds to make sure they understand that they can go to private childcare and what the plan is for that to happen. Mm -hmm. And moreover, first class pre-K um, funding can also go to childcare and um, you can help childcare programs get ready to deliver first class pre-K by helping them make facility improvements, you know, get education for their teachers and, and we can just help you learn how to do that in your community. Um, there's definitely, a, there's a state quality stars program that is basically the stepping stone for childcare programs to improve their quality, show that they are, you know, meeting higher levels of quality and get, and get funding support for that. I also wanted to add one more thing on childcare assistance, and that is that DHR, the Alabama Department of Human Resources, currently has a, um, a grant open right now called Temporary Assistance to, for Sustaining Child Care 2. It's the second round of um, these grants, and these are direct grants to child care providers who have really been struggling during the pandemic. We advocated really hard at the federal level, myself, my colleagues, lots of you on this webinar for child care to get um, the $50 billion that has been approved through these relief packages nationwide. And child care needs it. I know lots of programs have closed. Lots of programs have been on the brink of closer, closure. So please go to the DHR website. Um, no, to answer your question, Nina, no state or federal funds are, um, are allowed to go to unlicensed child care centers. You just need to go ahead and get licensed. 
Um, so any more questions and panelists jump in if you see questions that I'm not seeing. Someone asked about uh, funding on the league's website. You So you don't uh, really apply necessarily. Um, like I mentioned, those uh, cities and well, cities really over 50,000 will get a direct check from Treasury. And Anna, feel free to jump in if I'm misconstruing anything. But under 50,000 will come from the State De uh, Department of Finance. And, you know, there's some information you'll need to provide both entities in order to get your funding, but you don't apply on the league's website. Um, but the steps you do need to take in order to get your funding, that's what's on the league's website. Is that, does that sound accurate, Anna? Yes, it is accurate. I also did want to just clarify too and add in that um, the CCDBG funds aren't for unlicensed care, but if you want to think about some of the local fiscal recovery funds to think about how you can support child care and becoming licensed, um, that is something that cities have considered and have used. Um, one example is Walla Walla in Washington, who, seems, who is using some of their um, funds to be able to support family child care and becoming licensed, so some of that facilities improvements. So you can think about that, and I think that's kind of an interesting option to think about some of the sustainability long term and really how you can build the supply of child care in your community. Great. And help me out, panelists, because I'm not seeing other questions. Um, please do um, type your questions into the chat. We have one more minute. Allison, um, I don't have a question, but it would be great if Anna would put that resource she just shared, because we definitely have some trying to learn about QRIS that might not be licensed that that um, information will be extremely beneficial for. Wonderful. Absolutely. And I just typed in that, yes, we will be sharing everything with you later today in an email. So um, we're at that end of the hour. So without further ado, um, many, many thanks to the national and state experts that have taken time out of their day to be with us. Um, thank you, Secretary Cooper, for your excellent program and leadership. And uh, I thank the governor, um, you know, for her support. So please pass that along. And uh, yeah, congratulations to everyone who helped advocate for the $24 million pre-K increase that we just learned about that our state legislature approved the other day. Um, and let's work together to help all children get everything they need so that they can be successful in school in life and make our state a better place. Hey, Allison, someone did ask, and I did want to clarify because that it could have gotten yeah. I'm trying to find it now. Um, are cities allowed to use the money they are receiving for child care? Um, so, and, and again, Anna, jump in because y'all worked really hard on the rescue plan. We're taking a lot of resources from y'all, sending those to our members. Um, Right now, the only thing we know is water, sewer, broadband. Of course, those things are part of a child care facility, but I don't know outside of that, we've not received any additional guidance. Um, Anna, please feel free to add on. We've not received any additional guidance. What we have received is that it's um, you can use it for the things that were used under the first round of uh, the relief under the CARES Act. And some cities did use that funding to support child care either through vouchers or directly to providers. So we assume that that will be another option, but again, we're still waiting for guidance. And, and just to add to that, the some of the things that cities did with their CARES Act funding, um, you know, they did early childhood and a lot of that was try to, to try to help the childcare industry just get through COVID. But we think that this new funding um, that's going to cities and counties is actually gonna be even more flexible than the CARES funding was. So yeah, I mean, I'm feeling really optimistic. And so I wanna start working with a lot of you and I'm already working with some, some mayors on their plans for expanding pre-K and early childhood and, and supporting childcare with this funding. So yeah, let's start planning and we'll, we'll pass along the official guidance from the federal government when that does come out. Um, uh, thanks for all the activity in the chat. And you know, I'm willing to stay on to answer another question or two if our um, if our panelists are and if there's the demand, but um, we're going to close in in a minute or so. Do you see anything else? Okay, I'm just not okay. Okay, I'm just putting the link to our roadmap in one more time. Um, please check it out. 
um, use it to start the conversation with your local county commissioners, city council, mayor, school board, superintendent, um, and we will work with you every step of the way. And I know the Department of Early Childhood is also committed to, to working with you and helping to develop your plans. Thanks everyone for participating. Have a great weekend. Thank you, Allison. Y'all too. Bye everybody.